Hello everyone, my name is Jason Long. I'm the CEO here at Experience Care. And today I'm joined by Charles Oliver, uh, our Director of Customer Success, who is gonna take everyone through. What are we taking everybody through today, Charles? Uh, we're gonna take through the steps of projecting your PDPM score. Excellent. Yeah, it's as so, simply so and quickly as we can. <laughs> So you put together some documentation around this that you've used at a number of facilities. And um, and I, what I'm gonna do today is kind of just ask the questions as we go along and um, yeah, teach me. Tell me how to how to do this, how to, how to maximize my reimbursements. All right. So what we did with the user group is we kind of bounced back and forth all the things we learned from CMS and the seminars. This is you know early days, and we built a tool that can kind of help because it's not simple, straightforward to calculate. So I'm going to share on my screen this tool. Let me pull it up here so you can see me in it. Uh, so PDPM is a little bit different than RUGS. In RUGS, we had a one-to-one -one kind of relationship. You had these. Right, hold on one second, Charles. I don't think it's sharing. Can you try one more time? Drag to desktop to share. Ah, so it's going to make me share down here. Do you see it now? Yep, I got it now. Okay. We used to have like a, a three-level score. It was a very straight hierarchy. Now we have four sections. PT and OT make one group. ST makes a group. Nursing makes a group in, in non-therapy ancillaries. That's the other stuff that takes time to take care of. Um, those all four correlate to a letter, which then once again, crosswalks to some dollars, depending on you know where you're at and everything in the country. So I'm gonna step through this and this is the simple tool we came up with. There's different versions um, that can, can walk you through, but uh, this one seems to have gotten a lot of traction with the MDS nurses I've worked with. So the way it works at first is you have to calculate your PTOT ADL score because that's going to drive which category you fall in along with the primary diagnosis. So we start with that. Your scoring comes from section GG and it talks about the first three days of the stay. So how is the patient when they first come in? And you're going to score each of these fields based off of this grid here. So four points for independent. So the higher the number, the less physical care you're having to receive to get your ADLs done. Three points for supervision, if I touch you at all. Two points if I have to do what we used to call weight bearing, where I'm, I'm helping you extensively. And if I'm doing a substantial amount of the work, it's one point. And if you're totally dependent, zero. And so for eating, oral hygiene, toileting hygiene, those all directly correlate to a four, three, two, one, or a zero. When you get to the sit to lying or lying to sit of bed, each of those have a score and you'll get, a, like I said, if I had a four for sit to lying and I had a three for lying to sit side of bed, I would add those two up and divide them. So that would be seven divided by two. So I would get my 3.5 would be my average there. And so I'm gonna end up adding up this whole column. The same division thing happens with sit to stand, chair transfer, toilet transfer. I get an average. So at the bottom, I'm going to get an average. Hold on one second on that one. So uh -huh. you said um, on the sit to lying and lie to sit the bed, you said you divide them. Did you, right. you say you, you average them? You average them. Okay. You average them. Yes. Divide. I, I got confused. Okay. Gotcha. Apologies. Yeah. So, yeah. So if it's a three and a three, well, then it's going to average to a three. Gotcha. If it's a two and a four, it's going to average to a three. And so these three sections that are bolded together, they all work that way. And you end up with a total score. So that's step one of your PT. Step two is where you decide what the primary diagnosis is going to be. The thing that changed from previous Medicare to PDPM Medicare was before, if you went to a hospital, whatever the hospital treated you for would be my primary diagnosis in the nursing home. They took that away because they realized that we may be taking care of somebody post-acute for a very different reason than why they were in the hospital acutely. Good example is a Parkinson's patient who had a really bad urinary tract infection, ended up having to be on IV antibiotics, you know, and they, you know, because of their frailty, they needed to be in the hospital. Well, the fact that they had Parkinson's made them get so weak so fast, now they skilled they need skilled nursing care and they need physical therapy before they can go home. 
most elderly get a UTI, get antibiotics, get out in a few days and can go home. But when you have comorbidities like Parkinson's, that may not be the case. So that put us in a world where we've got to talk with our providers and we got to decide, is that patient with us because of the UTI? Because they've already finished antibiotics at the hospital, possibly. What am I doing around the UTI? I'm not doing anything really to this UTI anymore. So that actually means the reason this person's in my nursing home is likely because of the, the secondary effects of being sick with Parkinson's and now they're so weak. So if my doctor agrees that my primary reason for being in the nursing home is an exacerbation of their Parkinson's and the resultant debility, I don't use UTI as my primary diagnosis. I would use um, the, in the, I would fall into the neuro category. <clears throat> so that would put me down here and I'm going to end up being an M, N, O, or P for my first letter. So it all has to do now with the ADL score. And you're just going to crosswalk across. So if this patient was, if a, if a doctor did agree that the neuro is the issue, then I would fall into neuro. And then six to nine, I'm going to say my patient was a nine on my ADL score. That would make them an N. Now, these numbers are based on 2019, 2020, when we started PDPM. Uh, but each year, these changed a little, but not a lot. And so this would be your actual dollar amounts. But our first letter is an N. So now we know what our PTOT category is going to be. And the next category is speech category. Now, speech well, seemed really complicated until we stepped back and, and we kind of looked at it. Go, go back and, one for me real quick. Uh-huh. So that the score you just mentioned, does that go into your HIP score right here? Or Yeah, for this paper tool, we would go ahead and put our N in there. And if you wanted to calculate actual dollars, you could write in the dollar amount because at the end of this, you can add it all up. Gotcha. Last page. Okay. Uh, because, because they're cumulative as they go. So, so we know our first letter is an N. So now I'm going to go on to my speech one. And, and what we realize is the patient has to have um, a speech related comorbidity. Doesn't have to, but it, it increases the points. If your primary diagnosis is an acute neuro, you would get one point. Um, it would be up to the doctor to decide if that Parkinson's is acute versus chronic. It's probably going to be a chronic exacerbation, uh, depending on the diagnosis. So we probably wouldn't get that point for our patient. But if our patient does have anything up here, they're having some apraxia or they're having dysphagia now because they're so weak or they're having trouble forming their words because their stutter is worse, then they may have one of these. And in, in if they have that diagnosis, then they would, uh, you would add up your points here. So if I have, I don't, I can't take the first point for acute neuro because I don't feel like in this case it was, and the doctor agreed. I have one comorbidity. My patient does have a dysphagia. They're having trouble swallowing. So that's one point. Do they have a cognitive impairment? This comes off the BIM score. So if it's um, 12 or under on the BIM score, they will trigger for cognitive impairment. A lot of times people with Parkinson's will have a decline cognitively, and that's where the word salad and things like that may come in. So let's say we got two points. So I added these points up. So once again, I've got a crosswalk, and I'm going to go down for my scores, one, two, or three. So I'm a two. I'm in this column now for my speech. So I'm going to be a G, H, or I. So the question now is right here, do they have a mechanical altered diet or a swallow disorder? So mechanical altered diet is pretty straightforward. I just look at the diet order. If they're getting chopped meat or mechanical soft because of the dysphagia right now, then, then that gives me one of them. Swallowing disorder comes from section K. And if we code there that they're pocketing the food, they're dribbling, any of those things, then the, the MDS considers that a swallow disorder. So let's say that's the case in our patient. So we're at a two, we crosswalk. We have both of these two conditions. So that's going to make me an I for my speech category. And all of that was just capturing what I knew about the patient. So it wasn't as hard as speech initially looked. It ended up being just add up these three points that crosswalks you look and see if you got these two things. If you do, so now we're here. So now my hips became an NI. And so then I would put in my rate for ST depending on if I'm a preventer rule. Now, as we're going through this, 
Can you point out some of the issues that, you know, maybe, maybe your physician initially gave you a, um, you know, one particular uh, score and then you, you're coming back and you're changing things around or making recommendations to help maximize mm -hmm. reimbursements? Could you give me an example on this one? So, so yeah, so one of them would uh, be the, uh, the, the diagnosis back on the PTOT. Definitely, that's a big discussion with the doctor. Um, medical minds, they're used to hospital. They're, they're going to chart towards that UTI in, unless you have that conversation with them or unless they're really up on PDPM and seeing the patient you know, more holistically. A lot of times they'll just go ahead and be charting along that UTI because from a medical standpoint, they're monitoring the post care of a UTI. But when you get with them and you explain to them, you know, but this is really why they're here. They would have went home if they were still walking around, getting around fine. So that that's the first big discussion with the doctor. In in the speech section, you come you come around with a few things around dysphagia and apraxia. They will they they tend to defer to the the speech therapist expertise in this area. But a lot of times you will need to get the speech therapist to speak with them and, and explain, OK, here's what I'm seeing. That's why I think this is apraxia, because the speech therapist can't just give that diagnosis, but the doctor can with the right discussion. So that's where the interdisciplinary discussions happen, you know, and, and I may just pick up on the fact that, you know, um, one of the nurse aides, when I was asking about the patient said, yeah, she takes a long time to, to eat and swallow and and we're having to change her clothes three times a day. I'm like, well, why are you having to change your clothes? And then I find out, well, they're dribbling food. And so that's another place where, okay, now I'm going to go back to the speech and go, okay, I've got some swallow disorder presence here. And then now that becomes a discussion and not that answers your question, but it, it's very much a back and forth with the entire team. And in this world, the doctor gets to make the final call. Gotcha. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. Helping with the, the um, dysphagia, um, Exactly. Cool. So we're at an NI now. So now we're into the nursing. And so once again, there's an ADL score, but it's a little bit different. It doesn't have all the components. You'll notice it's missing the walking. Now you can pull those numbers forward from before, which is what you would do. They would be the same because they're talking about this, the same point in time. So the process is exactly the same. You would pull them forward. These two sit to lying and lying to sit with average into one number here in this column, and then sit to stand, chair transfer, all three of those with average here, and you would come out with a nursing score. So same process, a lot of the same numbers. This one just doesn't have as much as the PTOT bucket because from the nursing standpoint, walking isn't as much of a burden of care for us as moving them around in bed and keeping them from getting pressure sores. Before you go on to, to that next yep. one, are there any are there any ways in here to help maximize reimbursements? Or is this so, a very straightforward one that we don't really worry about? So when it comes to ADLs, it's really training at the, at the floor aid level, making sure they understand the difference between supervision, light touch versus moderate assistance. Um, we, we had, a, in, in the old days, we had a very straightforward weight bearing versus non-weight bearing. And they, they kind of changed the rules on us because Used to supervision didn't mean it just meant I was there and I did stuff with you verbally. Well, now they kind of added light touch. So I might touch your hand to remind you, OK, yeah, I've got to pick this up. That, that falls into supervision. But if I have to even slightly move your hand over to help you get the spoon to your mouth, now we're into partial moderate. So there's a lot of little details there. And so the maximization here is in your interview with your aides. You know, don't just tell me, you know, how much help does she need? Don't ask that question that way. Ask, describe to me how she gets the food from the plate to her mouth. What, what happens step by step? And that's where you'll pick up on those pieces. Gotcha. That's really good to know. That's really, really good to know. I, I wouldn't have known that one. Yeah. So yeah, the difference between MDS nurse now, I think in, in the old days, we coordinated a lot of paper and we were coordinating therapy minutes. We were really worried about, did they get their therapy? Did this happen? And now we're, we're really more worried about finding out what the patient's day is like and how much they do for themselves as opposed to how much we do for them. So there's a real incentive for us to really get down granularly, which is, is benefit to the patient. But we became detectives more so than we ever had to be in the MDS office. 
How much retraining does that take for CNAs who have been doing this for a long time? Uh, it, it's a tough comparison because, you know, we've been doing the other way for 20 years and then now they, they've switched the rules. Um, some companies, another place that they'll, they'll maximize the ADL scoring for GG because we still have to do section G, which is the old way for Medicaid. They haven't gotten rid of that yet. That may happen next year or the year after. We don't know. COVID pushed the dates out. Right now, you may be asking nurse aides to code the same event two different ways. That is probably a recipe for losing money. Gotcha. What some company strategies have been, and I'm glad you asked that question because this is a good strategy, is they've had the nurses doing section GG, which is affects PDPM. So now the nurses have been trained one way. Um, the, the challenge there sometimes is the nurses may not be the person who fed them and may not be the one who got to do it. So you have to teach them interview skills. Some rehab organizations have started taking over coding GG for the PDPM patients because they are actively doing all these tasks with the patients since they have direct knowledge. And so that I think is the best strategy for GG if your therapy company is willing to do that. Because now you've got someone with you know, college level experience, very focused, you know, very detail oriented or um, oriented person that can go in there and really, really you know, maximize what really happened with the patient. So that's the best strategy. I'm glad you asked that because that is probably one of the biggest strategies and that that would affect your PTOT bucket as well as your nursing bucket. Just that one coding being accurate. Sounds good. So. So we have an ADL score. Let's let's say in this case they came out an eight, and the, and it will often be different from the PTOT score because they're scored a little differently. Here's where we we kind of go back to the old way. So the nursing, we still have a rug that we work down. This this looks and feels a lot like Medicaid to us. So most of us kind of like this. So we, what you do is you work your way from top to bottom, <clears throat> trying to see where you land, and the higher up on this list is more money, which is also more difficult care. So extensive services, they have to have an ADL score of less than 15 or that will bump you down. So the ADL score does kind of apply here and it also will apply over here. But, but our patient, they had, let's, they had a score around nine. So if they had a trach or a ventilator or if they were in isolation for an actual inf you know, infectious disease and it has to be drug resistant, then you would crosswalk across this. So let's say our patient had isolation so I wouldn't even have to go down the page if, if they did. I, I would stop right there. I would crosswalk across. Um, they're isolation only. They don't have a trach or a vent. If they did, that would put me up higher. So in this case, I would come out with a C for this patient. So now it'd be an NIC. Now let's say they didn't have isolation. I'm just going to work my way down and kind of show you through this. So they didn't fall into this category. So now I go into the second category, the special care high category. And what I'm looking here for is anything that's going to get me into this category. Respiratory therapy times seven days is a good one to get you there. If you've trained your nurses, um, most LPNs have to have slight additional training on documenting respiratory assessment. It's easy to do. Most companies have this down now. Make sure you have it documented. If your nurses are doing NEBS seven days a week, you can capture that if the nurses do the minutes. And that would put me right into this category with just that. The other low hanging fruit you should always, always look for is if they have COPD, your very next thought and question should be, are they having to sleep up on pillows? Does the head of the bed have to be elevated? Because if they're doing that, it's because they have shortness of breath lying flat. The government realized that those patients take more time for us and, and they, they're more fragile, more prone to getting pneumonia. They need a lot more care. And so the government said, okay, that puts them in the special care high. That has to be very, very clearly documented somewhere, at least once in a look back period. This one is the very first question you'll ask as soon as you find out if they have COPD. Uh, this is another place where speech therapists can help you out. And um, people that sleep in recliners, those kind of folks, those are the ones that, that you're looking for that question. Some of these are straightforward diagnoses, quadriplegia. You know, you gotta have that diagnosis. That's gonna be obvious. Septicemia, that one, is a little bit different than sepsis. So you have to make sure you look at the diagnosis on that. Um, but generally septicemia is supported by labs. That's one I usually have to ask the doctor for the diagnosis for. Um, 
because from the doctor's standpoint, well, they're finished their antibiotics, they're not really septic anymore. But if the lab work shows that they're, you know, the white counts and things are still out of case, that may still be an active diagnosis. I must work my way down. Let's say none of this was true. So then I would end up in special care low. I'm looking around. Well, my patient had Parkinson's, right? And their ADL score was less than 11. So that's going to put me in the special care low. So this patient landed in special care low. And then I'm looking at ADL scores. And there's also, these are called end splits. And I didn't talk about this yet. There's a depression and no depression category. This comes from your PHQ-9. So if our patient had triggered for depression on the PHQ-9 section, then they would fall into this category right here because they had depression and then their ADL score was a nine. And so I would just keep crosswalking across and now I'm a J. So our patient would be a NIJ so far. Does that make just, sense? Just to clarify this. So I'm looking right here at the Parkinson's person. Yeah. And then I come down here and I say, okay, they are, they do have depression. They were uh, ADL of nine. And then, so that takes me over to a J. If right. they were on radiation, does this section here still apply? Or is that just for Parkinson's? Yeah, it, 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 it does. It doesn't, it doesn't crosswalk across these lines. It's, it's by column. So this inclusion criteria gets me into special care low. Gotcha. So it's and then from there, I crosswalk. My next question is, are you depressed? Yes or no? If you are, then you're going to be one of these two. You're going to be H or J. And then, then I, now I'm to the ADL column. And so wherever your ADL falls. So just, just to make 100% sure I got this, if, they're, if they have a foot infection, you still crosswalk over to here? Yes. Yep. Okay. Great. Yep. Yep, that's how it works, and it drills down to a letter. So, so we're we're an NIJ now for our patient. So that if they hadn't categorized there, they would fall in clinically complex. You would be looking for something here. If they didn't fall there, behavior. So you can see the money is going down. And the very last thing, if you don't qualify for anything, you always end up in physical function. But we didn't. We came out NIJ, and we would be able to put in our dollars here if we wanted. And then the very last thing are called NTAs, non-therapy ancillaries. And so, so there were research studies that were done back in the 70s, and then they did them again in the 80s, late 80s, maybe early 90s. And they started really looking at the amount of time different things required. And they started including nursing. The first research was around therapy. Therapists had a, a stronger body back then, a, you know, organization, and they did a lot more research. Well, nursing caught up. And and so the government had some real data to look at. And they realized that a lot of things that we didn't used to get paid for take a lot of nursing time. You know, asthma is a good one. That's one that you know, may, may require more time. I, I've got to have a med on hand. I've got to be aware of it. I've got to do lung assessments. And the way the NTA things work is it's pretty straightforward. If this column, the condition or service is true, then you get those points. And you're going to add up all those points. Now, this isn't the whole list. This, this is a kind of abbreviated list. We looked at it as a group and said, these are the ones that we usually can see. This is where you get to start playing a little bit of a detective and you get to kind of look and start asking some questions. So cirrhosis of liver is one that I'll teach a lot as a possible low hanging fruit. You will have you know, a chronic alcoholic patient who's no longer alcoholic, but they are on some meds and they, and they have to have their meds titrated. So you start to think, okay, they have some liver function issues. And so this is a discussion with a doctor. You know, do you think that they actually have a diagnosis of cirrhosis? Um, if they do, then you can capture that point, but it probably won't occur to the doctor because they'll glance at the labs and they'll go, oh, oh he's a prior alcoholic. I expected to see that lab. So it doesn't really occur to them that that's an active diagnosis, but for us, because we get NTA points and it paints a clearer picture of the patient, we should look for that. So that's one thing to look at. Inflammatory bowel, this is another one. You get to be a little bit of a detective. A lot of people don't get those diagnoses throughout their life. There's a lot of reasons that happens. A lot of times um, doctors are hesitant to give diagnoses because of insurance plans and things like that. They don't, you know, they really don't want to brand the patient if they're not absolutely sure. So that happens. With inflammatory bowel, my big clue has been when I ask somebody, are there foods you avoid? What are you allergic to? If I see you're allergic to seeds and nuts, there's a good chance you have an inflammatory bowel process going on. So that would be a question I would start talking about and then talking with a doctor because I'll be able to figure out health patterns talking with you. So that's another one. 
Uh, morbid obesity is pretty straightforward. That one's based off of, of a BMI uh, of a, you know, your average weight. There is an exception to morbid obesity. Morbid means it's slowly killing me. You don't have to weigh 300, 400 pounds to be morbidly obese. You can have a low level obesity that's still causing more, more morbidity, but that's up to the doctor to decide. So this is one of those cases where a lot of times we think they got to have a, a, a score at a certain level. And that's the way the RAI reads a little bit. But if you look a little bit closer on, on the, uh, the MDS rules, it actually says or if determined by the doctor. Fatty liver is a good example of that. Fatty liver could be a morbid obesity problem, you know, because they're, they, they're messing with their liver. Uh, but all of these will just add up. And so in our case, our patient, you know, they, they didn't get any IV meds with us. So I can't claim that. That was at the hospital. Uh, wound infection. I don't have any of that. Tracheostomy. Uh, morbid obesity. Uh, let's say, you know, that I was having to catheterize them. So I would get one point there. And so if I, if I work my way down on this and that's all I've got, I would crosswalk over here to this grid. And so zero points gets me F and this one kind of works backwards. So in the others, uh, the A might be the highest paying and this one it goes the other way around. But your goal is to get as many as possible. So I have one that puts me into an E. Say no, so this no. is where... You, 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 you said the crosswalk. In this case, the A is the highest. You said before the A was the lowest. Is that what you're it, it has been in some. Okay. And, and so there's a couple that reverse. So you can't assume A is the highest. Gotcha. You have to look at some, in this particular bucket, A is the highest. Gotcha. Um, so I have one. I, ha I have. Well, I thought you said, I, um, you said intermittent catheterization. Right. That's, uh, do we say this patient did or did not have uh, cirrhosis? So no, they didn't have cirrhosis on this one. That's our case study. Okay. So because I wanted to put us in the thought process, see, one to two gets me an E. If I can get to three somehow, look at the difference of dollars. It's almost 25%. So just getting that one, if I had none, that was $57. One got me to 76. So I need to get two more points to make it. So if I go looking and, and I can find out that a patient you know, had anything going on up here, a wound infection, if there's diabetes back there, or let's say, let's say that they were, you know, um, the uh, cirrhosis of the liver, that would only get me to two, right? But those are diseases that can be related to malnutrition. So I've really got to start looking at malnutrition. And this is where your dietitian comes into the picture a whole bunch. They have some malnutrition assessments now. Um, the American Dietetic Association has done a good job of getting a lot of information out to them. The doctor still has to give us a diagnosis, but this is where the labs come in again. And this is a place that doctor doesn't really think about either. The, you know, they're, they're a lot like us. They're, they're, they're not nutritionists. They expect the, the dietitians to do that part. You know, they learned it, some of it in school, but it's not forefront in their mind. And so you have to look at that. So I could potentially push this patient to a three. The NTA bucket is where the documentation part really comes in. You've really, really got to read through and scan for, you know, words that would make you think cirrhosis, words that would make you think malnutrition. You know, if you see words like, you know, underweight, poor appetite, and then you go looking at the labs and you see all kinds of electrolyte imbalances and things like that. So they may be in a malnutrition state. And so that's where that one comes in. Let's say in our case, we, we, did, we did catch that and we ended up getting to a three. So we're, what are we in? N, I, what did we say a while ago? J and then a D. So we would come out of D here. And that would be our HIP score. And then that all those dollars would add up to a rate. And that's what this little graph here, we didn't, you know, we didn't have anything fancy and electronic when we first started. We had it on paper. But this is how we would predict what we expected to get. So we would expect to get that NIJD. And then we would go and do our MDS. If we didn't get an NIJD, then we knew we didn't code something right if the doctor agreed to all the things we thought were accurate. And that was our double check because we, we built this tool because we realized we were having that issue. We were, we were not getting what we expected sometimes, and it was just human error because there are so many different things to consider. It's over 200 and something different points that affect reimbursement on the MDS now. And, but that's the process in a short 
as short and simple as we could get it was to, to go through each bucket. And I call them buckets. I got thinking about, you know, four buckets of water go in the bathtub. Well, this was the four buckets of money and the four buckets went into the bathtub of money. So. Sounds great. This is fantastic. I'm sure that people are going to find this really, really helpful. I, I absolutely found it insightful, uh, especially seeing where you were finding finding the money that, um, that I think a lot of other people out there aren't seeing. Mm -hmm. um, so great. Any other, any other final notes before we wrap up today? No, that, that's the, the biggest is you, you have to have a, you have to have a system, which is what this turned out to be for us. You have to communicate a whole lot. So you're going to find that you spend a lot more time with your doctors. You're going to spend, you find a lot more time with dietary than you ever did. And we already spent a lot of time with therapy, but instead of just talking with the rehab director, now you're speak, you're really speaking to speech. Speech really got a bump up in the world too, as far as what I consider post-acute care of respect. Nursing's all of a sudden getting paid. Speech is all of a sudden, you know, we're driving reimbursement now too, because we've been driving care all along. So you want you want to definitely be talking and teaching your folks those things that I was talking about. So, you know, the speech therapist should know um, that um, they're having trouble laying flat and stuff because they'll see it when they reposition them in bed. And that's a discussion with a nurse and those kind of things. So when you're when you're running through this whole thing. Do you actually run a meeting to have everybody discuss each uh, each patient, each resident, or how do you get everybody together on this? So, so what, what actually kind of turned out to be the practice we developed was on day one, the patient comes in, we're usually reviewing the paperwork we got from the hospital. You know, we're highlighting the things and we're making notes. We're starting to, this form. The patient may come after I left for the day. So I, I kind of started the process. On day two that morning, MDS nurse would go and lay eyes on the patient. Therapy would get in there and then they would do their avows usually on day two if they catch them on day one. So the MDS nurse and the rehab director would meet on day two. They met every day, but they would meet specifically to talk about this patient and they brought together a lot of information. And then by day three, we've usually went to the doctor. We went and talked to the nurses and we went to, um, gather some more information and at that point around day four we're talking to the care plan team and we're talking with the family so there's there's a, a new rules participation so we got to have a you know at least a, a brief care plan meeting with the family and the patient by the end of day three 72 hours depending on how you interpret it and so that was kind of the process you have two core people the rehab director and usually the mds nurse but very quickly you're pulling everybody in but by day three, our goal was to have projected a rate and already have a good, strong plan for what this patient needed to go home. That's that was the, the process that developed. And it may change a little bit as time goes on. You know, day five, we get all the labs back that we drew and we see that, oh, the patient has an A1C, you know, of six. Uh, there's an undiagnosed diabetes or maybe new onset diabetes or, you know, just because they're so stressed. So you may see things change a little bit as it goes. But. You should, by day three, have a pretty good bead on your patient if you're doing something along these lines. Sounds great. Sounds great. All right. Well, I think that's about as much time as we've got. So thank you so much. As always, incredibly insightful uh, and helpful information. And the, uh, the document you were showing, is that going to be available online for everybody as well? Yeah, yeah we can make it available online. Uh, okay. We can get that out there. Uh, we have uh, different resources and experience care. We can post it. And uh, probably along with this, if we put this into a blog, right? Yep, that's right where it's going. All right, thank you so much. And I'll talk to you soon. Okay. All right, see you, Charles.